Ben just invited me to it. Um, so you'll be oh, married. JP2? Off left. Yeah, philosophy of JP2. All right, we're recording, and now it should say live. Not yet. Good afternoon, all of you on the East Coast. Um, and for those of you who are uh, west of the Eastern time zone, we say good morning. For those who will be watching this in the future, hello. My name is Joel Falpash. I am a staff member with the Culture Project. I'm here today with Christopher West, the president of the Theology of the Body Institute, the catalyst for many conversions out there, uh, a lover of J, uh, JP2, who is the unofficial founder of the Culture Project, as well as the TOB Institute. There's no doubt about that. Uh, so we are here today to speak a little about Theology of the Body, uh, but more than anything, uh, we just wanted to discuss how the craving for Jesus as a human person should triumph and trump all other desires in this time of COVID-19. Uh, our thoughts and prayers are, are certainly with those who are str struggling and suffering right now. There is something that we are all missing. Um, very, for Catholics out there, very uh, tangibly, very substantially, and that is Jesus in the flesh. So we just wanted to, to talk about that, but first, um, Christopher, welcome. It's great to be with you. And um, yeah, do you want to say anything else about the, the TOB Institute and, and your journey before we jump in? Oh, I don't know that that is necessary. I do want to say thank you for having me. And I love the work that the Culture Project does. Uh, I love the name of the Culture Project. This idea that at the very foundations of culture, is an understanding of who we are as male and female and the gift and beauty of human sexuality. If we don't get that right, the whole culture is affected. Or, or you could put it this way. If, if, if the culture has a cancer, you have to treat that cancer at the cellular level. And the fundamental cell of culture is the family. And the nucleus of the cell that is the family is the sexual embrace. Without living human sexuality rightly, there's no family, there's no culture, there's no future. <laughs> so I love this idea of the culture project. The project of building culture has to begin with the basic building blocks. And that's the work that you do, that's the work that I do. Uh, love that we're doing this together and I'm just here to support you guys and. I, I just think what you're doing is great. Thank you. We, we appreciate that affirmation. I, I got to imagine uh, that things in, in this time of, of pandemic have actually, as you mentioned earlier, um, off camera have been busier. So thank you for taking time out of your sure. schedule. Um, don't worry, everyone. We already, we already got that sappy part of the interview out where I thank him for being such a big part of my conversion. And he thanks me for being such a big part of his. So we already got that out of the way. Don't worry about it. Uh, but you, you just touched on something that I actually would be, would, would like to dive into first and the beauty of the sexual embrace. I'm six months married. Um, I want to talk Woo! about before marriage though. Yes. Praise God for You're the, talk about the sexual embrace before marriage. I, no. <laughs> I didn't want to talk about the sexual right. embrace in my marriage. I, I, I want to talk about marriage prep and this, this theme, we heard it, it was beat into our heads. Fortunately, we had the Institute and, and obviously Theology of the Body and John Paul II as formation before we got into marriage prep. But this is a, a common experience in marriage prep for young couples. And I, I'm sure it will be for young couples, you know, until TOB really works its way into marriage prep um, globally. NFP more so as avoidance than anything else. So there is a lack of appreciation for the beauty of the sexual embrace, I think in, in young people who are talked to in marriage prep more from a scientific level about NFP, 
And here are the ways that where you can sort of find a loophole to not find, not having any kids. But yeah, the Odyssey of the body blew my mind. And I took my wife to the Institute uh, when she was my fiance about 10 months ago. And she, I think it was day four said nothing in my life will ever be the same. So it was about as good a marriage prep as we could get. Thank you for TOB one, uh, which Indeed. I recommend for everyone. But that beauty of the embrace is, is not talked about before marriage. And once, you know, we start to um, experience that, that knowledge of one another, as, as scripture refers to, to the embrace, we do sense that there's something more beautiful going on. But before marriage, we didn't receive that. Can you just speak to, yeah, young couples out there? Yeah, I'm First happy First and foremost, to. the beauty. I think the key, the key that unlocks the beauty is a proper understanding of sexual freedom. What do I mean? I don't mean sexual freedom as the culture means sexual freedom, right? The culture talks a big line about sexual freedom, but what does the culture mean? The culture means do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, without ever saying no. The culture, when it says sexual, when I say culture here, I mean the secular culture. Yeah. Right? The secular culture confuses freedom with license. The sexual culture says you will be free so long as you have no restraint in indulging your compulsion. Right? But true sexual freedom is not the liberty to indulge your compulsion. True sexual freedom is liberation from the compulsion to indulge. Only such a person can then be a gift, right? We can put it this way. If I am not in control of my desires, my desires are in control of me. And if my desires are in control of me, then I will inevitably seek to control other people to gratify my desires. This is not freedom. This does not lead to the beauty of human sexuality. This leads to the tragedy of not knowing how to love. This leads to the despair of being treated as an object, manipulated, used, and discarded. The beauty of human sexuality comes from the freedom of being a gift to another. I'll, I'll tell some uh, stories on myself here. Um, when I was a teenager, I thought I was sexually free. I thought I was sexually liberated because I had tossed off the oppressive shackles of my Catholic upbringing and I was indulging my desires with my girlfriend. Of course, when you are not in control of your desires, as I was saying, you end up controlling other people to gratify them. And so I became a manipulator. I knew how to push my girlfriend's buttons to get what I wanted because I was not in control of myself. I needed it. I, I was not free. And this wounded her profoundly and it wounded me profoundly. And we felt the pain of it, but we didn't know what the heck to do with it. And I remember one year, this is probably senior year of high school, there was still a little bit of that Catholic conscience in me that was bugging me. And, and I said to my girlfriend, I think we should give up sex for Lent. And uh, now, you know, you're supposed to give up sin all the time, right? Not just for Lent. But this is where I was in 1988 or whatever it was, 87. And, and the Lord works with us right where the we Lord, are. The Lord worked with it. I, yeah. I can guarantee you that. So, so she agreed. We decided to give up sex for Lent. Well, uh, Joel, guess how long I lasted? Oh, man. Not even a week. Three days. Oh, man. Three days. So <laughs> this was a ma – yeah, talk about the Lord working with me here. This was a major – wake-up call for me because I realized I was not sexually liberated. I was sexually enslaved. Oh, I could not say no. Is an alcoholic who cannot say no 
to the drink, is he free when he indulges in, in drinking or is he in chains? I was in chains. And I knew then I needed to go on a journey to discover what real sexual liberation is, what real freedom is. Again, sexual freedom is not the liberty to indulge my compulsions. It's liberation from the compulsion to indulge. I'm going to fast forward now to 1995. I'm dating my soon-to-be fiance and soon-to-be wife, Wendy. And I had been on quite a journey from 1988 to 1995. These were the years where I discovered John Paul II's Theology of the Body. It blew my world. It opened me up to a whole new possibility. He was the first person to really preach to me this authentic liberation from the compulsion to indulge. And he set me on a path of experiencing more and more this inner liberation. I'm still on that journey. The catechism is very clear here. It says self-mastery can never be considered one uh, once and for all. It demands renewed effort at every stage of life. And my, my life certainly bears that out. But I had experienced some major steps towards this freedom. And, and there I was, I'm holding Wendy in my arms. We're sitting on a, a, the edge of a, a cliff looking over the Susquehanna River 25 years ago. And I just want, I was filled with such a desire to affirm her, to bless her, to, to acknowledge her dignity. And I wanted her to know that I saw it. And right in that moment, Joel, I had this flashback to the way I used to operate with my girlfriend in high school and, and how I was just a manipulator and I would try to push her buttons to get what I wanted. Oh yeah, you affirm with something else in mind. Correct. I'm I'll remember tell you you're beautiful because yes. this is what will happen. I want this, I want this as a result. And I was not experiencing that with Wendy. I was experiencing a new, new liberation. And I said to her, here I am holding her, holding her in my arms. The wind is blowing. The sun is shining. The birds are chirping. And, and I, I, having that flashback, I just went, Ugh! I couldn't believe I used to think that way. And she said, what? what? What's wrong? What's wrong? And I said, Wendy, Wendy, I have no desire whatsoever to push your buttons. And she said, good. And I said, no, 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 you don't get it. I don't, I don't want to use you. I don't want to manipulate you. I don't want to try to get something from you. She said, good. I said, I just want to love you. I just want to tell you how good you are. I want to give you my whole life. And she said, good, good, good. That's freedom. I thought I could jump off that cliff with Wendy and fly. It was, it was liberation from the compulsion to indulge which enables us to become a true gift to one another, which enables us to, to circle back to the original question. It enables us to see the true beauty of human sexuality as a path towards the true and sincere gift of self. John Paul II puts it this way. He says that the body has the meaning of self-gift. And when we learn to make this gift of self, and only those who are free can make this gift. As we make this gift of self, he says, we fulfill the very meaning of our being and existence. That is the beauty of human sexuality. It is the beauty of learning how to love, how to bless, how to affirm, how to give life rather than how to use and dominate, manipulate and control and to rob life from others. The beauty of human sexuality is the beauty of living in the image and likeness of God, who is ultimate beauty. And we are to reflect that beauty in and through our bodies. It's called theology of the body. Body. Beautiful. I love it. I, it is beautiful. I it is. It is beautiful. I, and it's challenging. It is challenging to the bone but you cannot tell me that when you taste that freedom you cannot tell me it's not worth it forgive me i'm i'm i have songs in my head and one just popped go, in my head go 
You can't tell me it's not worth fighting for. You can't tell me it's not worth dying for. It is. The truth of love is worth dying for. The truth of human sexuality is worth sacrificing everything for. And if we don't know that, we need to discover it. Amen. Practical for those who are listening and for myself, there are ways even in this pandemic to build control and self-control and, and strive for that freedom in, in even the smallest ways and at least start to grasp, as John Paul II says, possess of oneself in order to give of oneself. There are ways that we yes. can build that control now, even though it feels like everything is out of control. Yes. And I'm blessed, I'm sure you are as well, to be married to a woman who understands the gift of self in that one of the most beautiful things she said to me when, a couple months into marriage is every time my body goes through its period, it feels like it's mourning. What if, if we had heard that in marriage prep, that like women, you are not just gift of self to husband, but your body is gift to your offspring. And women are under a, a spiritual attack that, that I don't think we will ever fully comprehend. Yeah. But it is, it, it is a privilege to be married to women who understand that gift of self and, and to really embrace their ability to give and, and hold life. And, and we have theology of the body to, to, to thank for that. Your wife is bringing up something very significant here, and as are you in this idea of the spiritual attack on woman. Uh, number one, I think you're right, Joel. We as men, <laughs> we're, we're never going to really understand what women go through here, both in the beauty of having a womb and the potential to, to bear new life within and give birth. We'll never, we're never going to experience that, obviously nor will we ever understand what they go through month to month in their cycles, right? But, I mean, I, I just like to point out, just to get, get us thinking in terms of the profundity of what a woman experiences month to month, women's cycles are connected to the moon. Have you ever thought of that? What does that mean? I have no idea, but it's true. It's connected to the moon. The moon is what determines a month, right? And a woman's period is, her cycle is based on the, the rotation of the moon around the earth. It is absolutely astounding. Here's another point. The, the attack on woman goes the whole way back to Genesis. The serpent Ooh. is after the woman and he hates her fertility, his enmity. It's right there in the book of Genesis. The serpent's enmity, that means his hatred, is aimed at her ability to bear offspring. What does the dragon want to do in Revelations 12 before the pregnant woman? He wants to devour the child. Satan hates, hates, hates our fertility. Why? Scripture says that, the, that Satan fell out of envy. Well, what is envy? Envy is not the same as jealousy. It's part jealousy, but it's even more. Jealousy says, I wish I had what you had. But envy goes a step further. Envy says, and I don't want you to have it. I hate that you have it. And I want you to hate that you have it. What do we have that angels don't have? Remember, Lucifer is a fallen angel. What do we have that the angels don't have? Bodies. Bodies. Come on. And what, what, what can our bodies do that angels cannot do? Procreate. There's no such thing as baby angels. Angels don't have baby angels, right? True. We, we have the ability in and through our bodies to be co-creators with God. The angels do not have this ability. So the angels are either in absolute awe of human fertility and the human body, human sexuality, 
or the fallen angels, they are in absolute envy of the human body and human sexuality and human fertility. When Gabriel comes to Mary, he's in absolute awe of Mary's body, in absolute awe of Mary's womb, in absolute awe of Mary's fertility. We have every reason to believe that when the angel came to Mary, it was peak fertile day in her cycle. Gabriel is in absolute awe because her fertility is about her sexuality, her femaleness, her womb, her ovaries, her egg is about to give flesh to the second person of the Trinity. The exact opposite happens to Eve in the garden. See, Mary is the new Eve, right? Both Eves were approached by angels. But one, the first Eve, was approached by the fallen angel. And he approaches in envy, in hatred, in enmity of the woman and her womb and her fertility and her ability to bear offspring. And his goal is to get her to hate her womb, her fertility, her ability to bear offspring. Joel, look at the culture today. Look at the secular culture today. Women hate, by and large, their womb, their cycle, their fertility, their ability to bear offspring. This is what the entire contraceptive abortion culture is. It is this enmity, it is this hatred aimed at the woman and her ability to bear offspring. That's what it is. Satan's goal is to turn the womb, the place of life, into a tomb, a place of death. But here's the good news of the gospel. Christ comes into the world. Let me get a visual. Hang on. Yep. Christ comes into the world to turn the tomb, the place of death, back into a womb, the place of life. See the shape in this is that icon a mandorla? In direction? That's the mandorla. You know what the mandorla is. Whoa, I'll explain to people. What yeah, because that is, is bizarre. So the mandorla, this shape, you're going to see it in sacred art all over the place. Here's another example of it. See the, that wow, shape yeah. behind Christ. He's inside it, yeah. That's the mandorla. You'll see icons of the Theotokos. I wish I had one right here. I don't. I don't have one handy. Uh, but the Theotokos is uh, pregnant Mary. Mary with the icon of, of Mary with Christ within. And oftentimes the shape of her womb is the shape of that mandorla. The mandorla, oh. the mando if you imagine two circles, two circles coming together, the shape that those two circles make as they join is the mandorla. And the mandorla is me, it's symbolic of the joining of heaven and earth. Look at Our Lady of Guadalupe behind you. It's a very artsy. It's a very artsy. Uh, oh, no, even yeah, even even probably a set. I'm guessing a yeah, a very um, not maybe not secular artist, but someone who is very uh, adding their own interpretation. Yeah, still, still, still. she changed Mandorla. a lot. She changed a lot about Guadalupe, and still has the mandorla. The mandorla is, is the symbol of the joining of heaven and earth, and it's the symbol of new birth, of new life. Right? It's a feminine symbol of openness oh. and new life. Right? So what's happening here? The tomb, the place of death, is now a place of birth, of new life. Right? He was born of a virgin womb, but he was born again of a virgin tomb. No one had been placed in the tomb, it says in Scripture. It was a virgin tomb. What's happening here? The new Adam 
is coming, is being birthed out of the earth, just like the first Adam came out of the earth. It's the eighth day. It's the day of the new creation. And look what he's doing here. He's pulling male and female, Adam and Eve, out of the ground. It's the resurrection. It's the redemption of human sexuality, of maleness, of femaleness. Christ came in the flesh to redeem us in the flesh. His first miracle is at a wedding. He came to restore human sexuality. Why? Because this is, the, this is what was most damaged in the fall. We see this in the, right in the symbols of Genesis. We see before sin, they were naked without shame. Why? Because they saw the theology of their bodies. They saw the glory of God revealed through their bodies. The, the enemy is after that. He wants to rob us of that. He wants us to hate our bodies. Naked without shame, before sin. Then they sin. What do we see? I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Christ comes into the world, born naked, out of the virgin womb of Mary, to redeem the woman and the man. The glory of masculinity is that the second person of the Trinity took on a male body. The glory of femininity is that the second person of the Trinity was born of woman. He came to redeem masculinity and femininity. This, this mystery of maleness and femaleness runs from beginning to end throughout Scripture. But the enemy, that's, why, that's precisely why the enemy is after our sexuality, because he doesn't want us to see what St. Paul calls the great mystery of our sexuality as the revelation of Christ's love for the church. So your wife, in her own way, whether she realizes it or not, when she says it's as if I'm, my body is mourning, during my, my, my period, my body is mourning. She is entering in to the sorrow and the labor of all of creation. Remember what does St. Paul say in Romans chapter 8? He says, the whole world is groaning as in labor pains. The whole world is groaning as in labor pains, waiting for what? The revelation, the birth of the children of God. The whole of creation is groaning, waiting for this to happen. The birth of the children of God. We, it groans, all of creation groans, waiting for the redemption of our bodies. It's all in Romans chapter 8. Your wife, whether she knows it or not, she's experiencing that in her monthly cycle. The groaning, the pain, the suffering, the, the PMS, all of it, all of that is part of the mystery of creation awaiting redemption. Praise the Lord. Beautiful. Thank you for clearing that up, for, for bringing clarity, and, and more than anything, bringing beauty to that sentiment. And, and I will be reminding her of that beautiful groan. That is, that is incredible. We, we've been to a lot of weddings in the last year and a half. And uh, I just want to, yeah, urge married, young married couples, embrace the fertility. Uh, we, we don't have any babies from those weddings. I think we've been to 11. Uh, and obviously, there are, there are so many issues that, that go into fertility. But embracing the beauty of it, like, like my wife so, so beautifully has, I think, unlocks a relationship with, with Christ that is hard to when you don't see the fullness of your gift because he came in the flesh. So the flesh must be important. It's ability to, to transcend any medium and, and for it to be a symbol of the eternal bliss that we are called to the wedding feast. As you said, a wedding was where Christ's first miracle came in. The flesh must be important. Well, all we have to do is look at the source and summit of our faith. The source and summit of our faith is the body of Christ given up for us. Sorry, I'm going to grab another visual here. If you have the Eucharist there, I'm going to be so jealous. 
if what? If you have the Eucharist there, I'm going to be oh, so Oh, wouldn't jealous. that be you nice? Have a, a I do priest not. sitting next to you ready to... <laughs> <laughs> the unity cross, the nuptial embrace of Christ and the church. This is the source and summit of... Our... Oh, yeah, baby, there it is. Going into there the bedroom. Is. Going into the bedroom. The source and summit of our faith is the bridegroom giving up his body for the bride. John Paul II says, the Eucharist is the sacrament of the bridegroom and of the bride. Christ is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. The bridegroom says to the bride, this is my body given up for you. Mary here at the foot of the cross is the symbol of the church. Of course, this is how the Baltimore Catechism puts it. In the flesh, Mary is always his mother. But in the spirit, she's the bride. She's Christ's bride because she's the symbol of the church. Obviously, it's a virginal, mystical marriage, but it is no less fertile. What does Christ say to Mary? He doesn't call her Mary. He doesn't call her his mother. He calls her woman. He calls her woman. And then he says to, that's, a, that's Adam saying to Eve, you are woman, right? He's the new Adam, she's the new Eve. He says, woman, behold your son. The son here is the beloved disciple. John is the mystical offspring of the mystical marriage of the new Adam and the new Eve. And this is the only way to enter the kingdom, Jesus says. He says to Nicodemus, in order to enter the kingdom, you have to be regenerated. You have to be born again. And Nicodemus is all confused, like, what? What, can a man enter his mother's womb a second time? And Jesus says, Nicodemus, if you don't understand the natural reality of generation, you're never going to understand the supernatural reality of generation. Because grace builds on nature. We have to understand the natural reality of male and female, and the call of the two to be fruitful and multiply in order to understand the supernatural reality of the Eucharist. The Eucharist is, is where the bridegroom gives up his body for the bride, and she conceives supernaturally all the offspring that make up the church. Where are we, where are we conceived and brought to birth? It's called baptism. Baptism, the catechism says it in Catechism 1617. The catechism says, baptism is a nuptial mystery. A nuptial mystery. The baptismal font is the womb of Mary. <laughs> it's the womb of the church where we are regenerated by water and the spirit. And that regeneration, grace builds on nature. Rebirth, regeneration, is based on generation and birth. It's based on the male and the female, the bridegroom and the bride, the two becoming one flesh. This is why the attack on human sexuality in the world today, the attack on marriage, the attack on pregnancy, the attack on the family, it is ultimately an attack on Christ and the church. Satan wants to take out nature in order to take out supernature, the supernatural, because the natural is the foundation of the supernatural. He's, af he's after Christ. He's, oh, he's an antichrist from the beginning. He, how do we recognize the antichrist? This is back to your point, Joel, about how important the flesh is. The flesh, the flesh, Christianity is not salvation from the flesh. Christianity is salvation of the flesh, right? How do we recognize the Antichrist? St. John tells us the Antichrist is the one who denies Christ come in the flesh. That's the card he always plays. He wants to devour the flesh. He wants to devour the child. That's what he does. That's who he is. 
but his head is already crushed, right? We know who wins this battle. The question is, are we going to enter into this battle with Christ and come out the other side, right? Or in other words, are we going to live our baptism? Mm, amen. Are we going to live our baptism? That, that's beautiful. I, I absolutely love the wisdom and truth that you just dropped. And for those who might need a reminder of, of who crushed the head of the serpent, it is our mother. Christ on the cross doesn't say, woman, behold your son, son, behold your woman. No, he says, behold your mother. It, it is our mother. She's our mama. She is our mama. It's, it's your mama that crushes the head. Invite her into your battles, especially those in regards to the flesh and sexuality. And, if um, God is your father, Jesus is your brother, then Mary is your mother. It's, it's the family of God. Are you in the family of God or are you not? If you're in the family of God, Mary is your mama. Mary is your mama, not not in some wistful, ethereal way. She is more your mama than your earthly mama is your mama. Amen. Because remember, the natural is just the sign of the supernatural. The supernatural is more real than the natural. The, 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 the marriage of man and woman is just the sign of the marriage of Christ and the church. This is the marriage that lasts forever right? Your marriage to your wife, as beautiful as it is, it's something of this earth. Temporary. It's, it's going to end with death, right? Until death do we part. I mean, in some way, in some way, all that's beautiful and human here on earth continues in the next life. But it, it, so it's not going to be deleted. Your marriage isn't going to be deleted in heaven. No. It's going to be completed yes. in the marriage of Christ and the church, right? And this is why Jesus says, in the resurrection, we're no longer given in marriage because you no longer need a sign to point you to the eternal marriage when you are living the eternal marriage. That's the union for which we are destined. And this is why we can understand also why Jesus calls some to remain celibate for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, the eternal marriage. Some skip the sacrament of marriage to devote themselves entirely, even here and now, to the ultimate marriage. Celibacy for the kingdom is not a rejection of our sexuality. It's a way of living out the ultimate truth and meaning of our sexuality, which is the call to union with God. Amen. I have to thank definitely my bride, but more so priests, for showing me the importance of the opening, the reception man as bride only makes sense in the supernatural context. And yeah, so priest... let's talk about that for a second. What does that even mean? So in the analogy, the spousal analogy, and, and keep in mind, of course, it is an analogy, and eventually analogies break down. God transcends any imagery that we can ever use, right? So all analogies are inadequate. However, the spousal analogy is the least inadequate. It's the best analogy we have, as John Paul II said. In all of this world, John Paul II said, nothing communicates the divine mystery more than the mystery of marriage and the family. In all of the created world, nothing communicates the divine mystery more than that. But again, keep in mind, it's an analogy. But in this analogy, God is always the bridegroom, and humanity is always the bride. Why? This is love. Not that we first love God, but that he first loved us. Look at the anatomy, right? It is the bridegroom who gives the seed. It is the bride who receives the seed. This is not just biology. This is theology. It's theology of the body, right? Our bodies reveal the, the male body reveals that fatherhood of God, that life-giving initiation of God. Every gift comes from God as its origin, right? The life, the seed originates in the male. It is given to the female who receives and conceives and bears forth. So John Paul II says that woman 
is the model and the archetype of the whole human race. Because to be human, whether you are male or female, to be human means to open, to receive and conceive and bear forth, right? So this truth, all the devil can do is take the truths of God and <laughs> twist them up, right? He doesn't have his own clay. All he can do is take God's clay and twist it up. So the man who feels like a woman and wishes he had a woman's body, he's confusing the mystical reality that he himself in his deepest being is meant to open to God. He's not meant to be a woman to another human being, but he is meant to be feminine in the sense of this analogy in relation to God, right? Similarly, uh, you know, a woman who wants to be a man, what she really wants to be is more like Jesus. She wants to be a true follower of Jesus, right? We are meant to integrate within ourselves, I as a male, you as a male, we are meant to integrate within ourselves what you might call the masculine and feminine principles. And when, we, when you and I as men, as males, when we rightly integrate the masculine and feminine within us, what you will have the offspring of that marriage, so to speak, will be an integrated masculinity. For a woman, the offspring of the integration of masculinity and femininity within will be an integrated femininity, right? And this, this is how we heal from all these exaggerated stereotypes and, and, and all the, the gender confusion. It's healed by living rightly within the marriage of the masculine and the feminine and letting that manifest itself in our proper male or female identity, right? Amen. So gender, the very word gender, what does that even mean? We have to go back to the etymology of the word. Gen, look at that word gen, that root. We see it in words like generous, generate, progeny, generous, genealogy, right? What does gen mean? It means to produce, to give birth to. Gender means the manner in which you generate new life. That's what the word means. And that is determined by another gen word, your genitals. The male gender generates new life through testicles and sperm. The female gender generates new life through ovaries and a womb. This is the gender difference. It is meant for the generation of new life, right? Gender means the manner in which you generate. There are only two ways to generate, with sperm and with eggs. How many genders are there? Two, <laughs> right? In a world that thinks you can have an infinite number of gender identities and sexual orientations, we have ruptured identity from the body. We've separated. We, we're back to the Antichrist. How do we recognize him? He's the one who ruptures the flesh and the spirit. That's the Antichrist, right? And so we live in a world <laughs> where it's demanded in law that we identify every body without identifying his or her body. What happens when you try to identify somebody without hit reference to his or her body? You quite literally identify no body. So in this world, uh, all this talk about identity and the truth is we are becoming a culture of no bodies Amen. because of this rupture from the body. Ours is the faith of incarnation. The enemy preaches excarnation. Christianity preaches incarnation. 
Lucifer preaches excarnation. You tell me what direction is the secular culture moving in today? Incarnation or excarnation? Excarnation. Excarnation. Quickly. Quickly, rapidly. There's a word for excarnation. There's a word for the separation of body and soul. It's called death. A culture of death is a culture that ruptures the body and the soul. That's what a culture of death is. A culture of life is a culture of incarnation. My wife is a pro-life missionary. She works for a great organization who is fighting against abortion. That is a culture of death. And this is why I'm grateful for the TOB Institute and for the Culture Project, because abortion needs to be battled at its root. We, if we don't go to the root here, Joel, we are spinning our wheels. Amen. We are spinning our wheels. And the root is precisely this rupture of body and soul in ourselves, in the way we understand being male and female. And it goes back also to what we started our conversation with. What is authentic sexual freedom? There's one reason, there's one reason we have abortion in the world. Because we are enslaved by lust. See, not only are we willing to manipulate and control other people to indulge our lust, we're also willing to kill. We are so enslaved by our lust, we are so enslaved by our sexual desires that are totally out of line, that we are willing to justify killing in order to indulge them because we don't see a way out. We don't see any other way out. If I'm going to indulge my sexual desires whenever I want, with whomever I want, however I want, well, I don't want all these babies, so okay, I'll I'll just justify killing them. It's just a clump of cells. Excarnation right there. Rupture of body and soul, right? It's just a clump of cells. Rupture division, death, Yep. we have, Christ is working a great salvation because all of this pain we're in, all of this suffering, think of how, you know, pain, when we are in pain, it has to come out. Think of all these dramatic body piercings. Think of all these these strange body alterations. Think of women out there who hate their breasts so much that they're asking surgeons to cut them off. Not because they have cancer in the breast, but because they just don't like their breasts. Think of men who have come to hate their genitals so much that they're going under the knife to have them cut off. This, this is a body hatred. And it is, it is an expression, it is an outward expression of the interior pain that we are in. And I would, I would even suggest here, and I got this insight from a, a Greek Orthodox theologian. His name is Dr. Timothy Petitsis. And he says that this pain of strange body piercings and grotesque tattoos and body alterations and sex change operations. This is like a a proto-repentance. It's a groaning of creation. It's this cry, this inexplicable pain that we are in. We are groaning and that cry is reaching heaven. And he is coming in the flesh to redeem our bodies. He's coming. All flesh will see the salvation of God. This is our faith. All flesh will see the salvation of God. He has already borne in his own flesh all of that pain. He has already borne in his body that, that, that grieving, that loathing, that pain. We dumped it on him. And I love the way Mel Gibson put the line of the psalm in the, in the mouth of Christ, right before the scourging, in the passion of the Christ. Do you remember what Jesus says in Mel Gibson's rendition? It's a line from the Psalms. He says, my heart is ready. Father, my heart oh, is ready. Oh, yes. What was he ready for? 
he was ready to absorb in his own body all of our hatred of our bodies. What is the crucifixion of Christ? It is all of Satan's hatred at the body that he convinced us also to take on. It is Satan's hatred of the body working through human instruments to unleash diabolic hatred on the word made flesh. And what is God's response to that? Woohoo! Victory! <laughs> you cannot win, Darth. If you strike <laughs> me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Yes. What happens when Christ absorbs all that hatred of the body? He absorbs it and he comes out the other side, turns it inside out, and now the wounds shine with glory. Glor the glorification of the body is God's response to the diabolic hatred of the body. And we can ride this wave from here to here. It's called baptism. It's called living our baptism. Do you not know that you who are baptized in Christ have been baptized into his death? And so also you've been baptized into his resurrection. Resurrection of the body. And everything that you don't like about your body, all your spiritual and emotional wounds that are lodged even in your body will be glorified and shine with all the glory of Christ's resurrected body. This is the promise of our faith. Salvation of the flesh, not salvation from the flesh. This Amen. is our faith. Amen. And a, a great way for, for all of us to begin appreciating our flesh more and more when this, when the restrictions are lifted and mass and the Eucharist and Christ in the flesh is available again, go, go receive him, go receive the bridegroom, everyone, everyone who is listening, go. So I'm, go I'm going to loop him. back to your, your, one of the things you said early on in our conversation about NFP and how NFP is usually presented, natural family planning is usually presented merely as a way of avoiding a child, right? So we can, we can loop together lots of themes here, and I'm going to do this quickly just for the sake of time. We talked about beauty, and we can only understand the true beauty of human sexuality if we are truly free. We talked about the difference between a false freedom and a true freedom. That true sexual freedom is not the liberty to indulge my compulsions. It's liberation from the compulsion to indulge. Only then can we see the dignity of the body and become a gift in a way that fulfills us, right? This is the gift of natural family planning. It gives us authentic freedom because you have to say no in order to say yes. And your yes means nothing if you cannot say no. If you cannot say no to your sexual desires, your yes is emptied of all meaning. Natural family planning, when a couple brings this into their lives, and I suggest to married couples all the time, whether you need to avoid a child or not, you should be working times of abstinence into your married life. Because the ability to say no is the prerequisite to the beauty of the yes. And that ability to say no also increases the yearning to say yes in the right way. And now I'm going to tie that all into what you just said. Because of Corona lockdown, we have needed to say no to receiving the bridegroom in the Eucharist. And many people, not just I, but many have made the connection. This is kind of like NFP, where a husband and a wife are needing to abstain from their embrace. That should be increasing our yearning and purifying our yearning for Christ in the Eucharist. So if the, if the fruit of not being able to go to Mass during this lockdown has been an increase of burning and yearning for union with Christ in the, sac in the Blessed Sacrament, praise God, that's a beautiful fruit. That's the direction of incarnation, right? 
But if the fruit of not going to mass for the two months was, was like, oh, I can just have spiritual communion. I don't really need to go to mass. That's excarnation. That's the movement of excarnation. <laughs> and the lesson will have been lost on us, right? Amen. I believe the Lord is allowing this time to increase the yearning for his coming in the flesh, which we can experience already in the blessed sacrament. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the, the beautiful synopsis. You, you tied everything together. We are, are so blessed to, to have you. Uh, we got one great question from Emily. I'll answer it in, in less than 60 seconds. How do you know you're in a relationship for the right reasons? Being in love versus not wanting to be lonely. Um, uh, yeah, making sure that um, Christ is the person who gets our loneliness first and foremost everything every relationship will funnel from that uh, i think do you have a, a quick comment before i, oh, I, I just want to affirm you that's a i like the way you said that it's concise and it's so important because every married couple will learn and joel i know you're still in the newlywed phase Co covid19 has done a good job of ending the honeymoon phase <laughs> it, it really has. it really has <laughs> so every married couple will learn that if you take the ache of loneliness that belongs only to God, that only God can fulfill, if you expect another human being to fulfill that, you are in for a major disillusion, right? And we often think of disillusion as being a negative thing. But no, being disillusioned is very positive. We don't want to have illusions. We want to be disillusioned. We want to have our illusions removed, right? Sure. And it is an illusion to think another human being can take away that fundamental ache of loneliness. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until we rest in you. In the famous words of St. Augustine, that's the truth of the matter. And if you put the burden on another human being to be what only God can be for you, you will crush that other, uh, that other human being. Do not hang your hat on a hook that cannot bear the weight. So it's a great answer, Joel. Take the loneliness to the Lord. And if the Lord in his plan wants you to be married, then that other person will become a sacrament of the Lord to you, but not the end game, not the, don't, marriage is an icon, a sign that points to these heavenly things. Don't turn the icon into an idol. Amen. Amen. On that note, thank you so much, um, Christopher, for yeah, the incredible wisdom. I'll be going back and, and rewatching this. I'll definitely be running it by my wife. I hope she's okay with everything I shared. I'm sure she is. God bless you and, and your family. Anything else you, you want to wrap up and plug for I the just want to say I want to say thank you to the Lord. I want to say thank you for his grace in my life. I want to give him all the glory. If anything I shared here has spoken to your hearts out there, know that it is the Lord speaking to your heart. It is the Lord through this weak, broken, sinful vessel. He, we give our yes and he shows up. That's the way the incarnation works, right? Mary said yes and the word was made flesh. So that's the goal, just to say yes. Uh, and if, if anybody out there wants to dive more deeply into the theology of the body. Uh, you can learn more of our courses. Just go to theologythebody.com. I'd also recommend our uh, recent virtual conference that we held a couple weeks ago. All the talks are still available. We had over 80 speakers. I'm listening to one talk a day and I'm being so enriched. It's so exciting for me to see how other people uh, integrate this teaching into the way they present the faith. It's just beautiful. We have, yeah. So anyway, uh, you, I think you can share that link, right? TOBvirtualconference.com. Yeah. Yep. We'll, we'll make sure we share the link. Th yeah. Thank you for sharing that. All glory to God. And um, yeah, our mother took care of us today. Uh, that's for Amen. sure. Um, thanks. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, tonight at 7 p.m., the Culture Project, we'll have uh, Nathan, Sam, Jesse and Will together to talk about masculinity ties in perfectly to our conversation today. The culture project lives on the Institute lives on 
Um, if you guys would consider making a donation to the Culture Project, you can do that at thecultureproject.org. Um, thanks for everyone for, for submitting questions and for tuning in. It was a gift to be with all of you uh, and, and most certainly a gift to be with you as well, Christopher. So we'll end the Facebook portion now. Thank you so much and God, God bless. bless. You, Joel, and God bless all the listeners out there. Peace. Peace.